Hi everyone, in this video I'll explain how various substances dissolve in water in a process known as solvation. Let's start off by remembering hydrogen bonds from the last video. Since water molecules are polar, meaning they have partially negative and partially positive regions, when two or more water molecules get near each other, they can be attracted. Like these two molecules here, with the negative oxygen of one being attracted to the positive hydrogen of another. That attraction has a name, we call it a hydrogen bond. So we've seen already that water molecules have this unique ability to be attracted to each other. It's not just to each other. Water molecules actually also have an ability to be attracted to other particles as well. And this is what allows water to be so good at dissolving other substances. So really what we're going to be looking at in this video is what's happening with the particles when things like sugar or salt, a process we've seen many times, we know that when we add salt or sugar to water and stir it around, that sugar or salt dissolves, but we're going to be looking at the particles and describing exactly what's happening. Before we take a look at this process, there is some vocabulary we have to go over first. Every solution has at least two components, the solvent and the solute. You've probably heard these words before. The solvent is officially described as the dissolving medium. What that really means is the solvent is what other substances are dissolved in. That's a nice way to help remember which one it is. The solute is what gets dissolved in the solvent. If we apply those two definitions to our clip of some salt being added to water, since the salt is getting dissolved in the water, that makes the salt the solute and the water the solvent. We'll mostly be talking about a special type of solution in this video called an aqueous solution. All that means is it's a solution where water is the solvent. These three definitions are some of our key ideas for this video. Make sure you pause, take a moment to write them down. Now we're finally ready to take a look at this process known as solvation. This is the actual description of what's happening with the particles when a solute becomes dissolved in a solvent. So let's take a look at how it works with a common solute like table salt, sodium chloride being dissolved in water. So here's a close up view of some sodium chloride crystals. You can see they form these little cubic shapes. What I want to do is zoom in on just one of these crystals of salt so we can get an accurate picture of what the particles inside that crystal look like. Now sodium chloride is an ionic substance so it's made of a repeating structure of positive, negative, positive, negative ions all arranged in uniform rows and columns. So now that we know what these sodium chloride particles look like, we can start to imagine what might happen to these particles when we add them to a beaker of water. So right now we're going to pretend that the boundary of the video screen is the beaker. It's full of water molecules. At the bottom of that beaker I have a chunk of salt crystal. Um, you can imagine that all these water molecules in real life would be moving around uh, because they are liquid and liquid particles have lots of motion. We're going to focus in on just these two particles here and show how they might move. So here we go, we'll start the moving. And it is possible for these two particles to move in such a way that eventually they collide with the salt crystal itself. And if they do that in just the right way, you'll notice their positive hydrogens are colliding with the negative particle in the salt crystal. And since a positive got near a negative, an attraction can form between those water molecules and that negative particle in the solute. And that attraction can be strong enough that when these water molecules bounce away again, they can actually completely separate and remove that ion from the salt crystal. That solute particle has been separated from its original chunk of solute and is now considered to be dissolved. And this process doesn't happen just once. There's lots of other water molecules that are also moving around. Let's focus on these two over here on the right. If they move in such a way that the negative oxygen atoms collide with this positive ion, negative to positive, an attraction will form between these molecules and the solute and it can be so strong that when they bounce off again, they pull that positive ion away from the chunk of solute. This positive ion has now been dissolved. And this process happens over and over and over again. So this particle is removed by waters and this one and this one and the process continues and continues and that chunk of salt gets smaller and smaller and smaller until from our eyes, 
you can no longer see it. It almost looks like it's disappearing. But what's really happening is all those solute particles are being separated from each other and the whole chunk of solute eventually becomes dissolved. So that's what happens during the process of solvation and that's how water can dissolve things. That's also one of our key ideas for this video so make sure you take a minute to draw out these little models and write a brief description of what's taking place. This is also a good time to talk about what types of substances water can actually dissolve because it can dissolve a lot of things but it can't dissolve everything. In general, water can dissolve substances with particles that water molecules are attracted to, just like we saw with the positive and negative ions in salt. Because they're attracted to the waters, the water molecules can pull them apart and separate them. So let's make a brief list of some other substance types where this can happen. The first thing on that list is many different ionic substances are soluble in water. Why? Same reason we saw with sodium chloride, Ionic substances are made of ions, so the water molecules will be attracted to them in the same way we saw in the previous model. For example, table salt, like we saw with sodium chloride, or MgF2, or CuSO4. How can you identify ionic substances? It's something we've learned before, but it's been a while. You're looking for metals bonded to nonmetals. So metals on the left side of the periodic table, beneath the staircase, nonmetals on the right hand side above the staircase. Any substance that looks like that or is made of those types of atoms is ionic and it will probably be soluble in water. But ionic substances aren't the only things that have particles that water is attracted to. Water as a polar molecule would also be attracted to other polar molecules. Other polar molecules have partial negative and partial positive poles just like water does, so attractions will form between those particles and water molecules too, allowing them to dissolve in water as well. Some examples of this would include sugar, NH3, which is ammonia, or CH2O, which is formaldehyde. To identify polar molecules, you want to look for molecules which are made of only nonmetals, so only atoms above the staircase on the right hand corner, and that molecule should have the atoms asymmetrically arranged. Let's take a quick look at what you can expect in terms of asymmetry. We can use NH3 and CH2O as some good examples. To see if a molecule has asymmetry, the first thing you need is a Lewis structure. You can draw it yourself or you can just give it a quick Google and look it up. Here I can see the Lewis structure for NH3. Because there's a lone pair on top of the molecule that is not mirrored by a lone pair on the bottom, that gives this molecule asymmetry and that's how I know that a molecule like NH3 would be polar. Doing the same thing with CH2O, here's the Lewis structure that I drew out. Remember, you could look that up as well. There's an oxygen on the right hand side with two hydrogens on the left. That is also definitely an asymmetrical arrangement, leading me to think that CH2O is also a polar molecule and would also be soluble in water. So here's a summary of that list of things that can dissolve in water. Also one of our key ideas for this video, make sure you pause and take a moment to write those down. That concludes this video on the dissolving process. Here's a brief summary. 